Kevin Clarkson here. I want to just invite you to our next conference, Prophecy Summit. It's going to be in beautiful Colorado Springs, Colorado, August 6th, 7th, and 8th. And we would love to have you join us. We'll be at the Marriott Hotel on Tech Center Drive there in Colorado Springs. We have a lineup of 22 speakers. And although I'm not going to name all of them right now, some of our headliners are Bill Salas, uh, Dr. Gary Frazier, Don Perkins, Pastor Billy Crone, Bob Cornuk, who will be telling us about his uh, discovery of a possible another site for the temple in Jerusalem. Jerome Corsi of World Net Daily, Joseph Farah of World Net Daily, Dan Goodwin, one of our favorite Kentucky preachers, uh, Jim Fletcher, a great prophecy student. These and others, I'll be there myself. I uh, look forward to always meeting those of you that are a part of our audience and follow the uh, prophecy of the Lord and how it's playing out in world events today. I hope you'll join us. Hello and welcome to this edition of Prophecy in the News. I'm Kevin Clarkson, your host, and we're delighted you joined us for this show today. My guest is Tom Ellis. Tom, uh, you have quite a storied career, I think, as a servant of the Lord. Uh, you've been a pastor, uh, you said 43 years, I believe, and then you had the privilege of serving on the mission field in Zimbabwe, Africa, and later returned to lead our mission organization, the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, and between vice president and president there, uh, a number of years in this last decade. And the treat to having you today is, I think, you bring maybe a breadth of understanding of what God's doing around the world, and I just want our viewers to know that part of the return of Christ, although we can't hasten it or make it happen, he said that this gospel would first be preached to all the nations of the world, and then the end would come. That's in Matthew 24, 14. And Tom, you know that beautiful vision in Revelation when the church redeemed is gathered around the throne and the Lamb, and John looked and he said, I saw people from every tribe and nation and language and tongue, and they were all with one voice saying, you are worthy, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. And uh, I'm part of that blood-bought tribe, and so are you. Beautiful picture, isn't it? It's our heartfelt desire to see everybody that can come into that tribe. And Kevin, it's a, it's a real thrill for me to be on the show today because uh, I had the privilege of being J.R. Church and Linda Church's pastor for 20 years. And I uh, have great, great, great regard for this show and respect for him and for the many, many years of ministry and service on Prophecy in the News. And so it means a lot to me well, that's just to be here with you. That, that's pretty special. And if we have any new viewers today, uh, you may or may not know, J.R. Church is the founder of this ministry and had a real heart for God. And, you know, I want to relate this uh, whole thing, too, to practicality. I love the study of Scripture and prophecy, and I know you do. But even the day that Jesus ascended into heaven, the two angels said, you men of Israel, why stand you here gazing up into heaven? Mm -hmm. Because Jesus had said, after you receive the Holy Spirit and the power comes upon you, you shall go and be witnesses unto me. So as intrigued as we are about watching Jesus ascend and wondering when he descends and we can ascend to meet him in the air, we've got a job to do. Well, we do. And uh, we do it with an understanding that he is coming. Amen. There's going to be a moment when he calls his church to be with him. And uh, that's, that's going to be an incredible moment. But between now and that moment, uh, we have an awesome task. And that is to share the gospel with every language, people, tribe, and nation on this globe. You know, there are 7 billion people on this globe right now, approximately. That's billion with a B. That's a lot. It, well, it doesn't sound too big to folks in Washington, D.C. <laughs> <but it laughs> they spend sounds trillions. big to me, okay? But really... Now, it would take you over 30 years to count to 1 billion at one number a second. So 7 billion, that's a, that's a lot of people. It takes 210 years yeah, if I did my right. math correct. That's exactly right. And every one of those people deserves, they have a legitimate reason to expect that if they can just hang on, somebody's going to get to them with the truth of the gospel. And uh, there, it's not like they're just going to sit around and wait for folks to show up with the gospel. People are showing up with all kinds of perverted, uh, twisted religions. Oh, my, yes. And we see that playing out right before our very eyes today. And so there is this sense of urgency. Amen. And they're dying. Uh, if you, if you want to think of it this they're way, perishing. about a million people a week die. Now, that, that is staggering. You take a Google view of Earth, 
yes. all of a sudden a city of a million people just disappears. Every week, a city of a million disappears, most of whom have never heard the gospel in such a fashion that they can comprehend it and then respond to it by faith in Jesus Christ. Well, I'm so thrilled to have you because I think you're so much more acquainted with some uh, factual information than, than I would be specifically. But when you say most of whom have never heard, are you able to put a, a percentage on that? Let's say of 7 billion people, what percentage have yet to really hear the true gospel? Well, we can do a pretty good job at putting, putting uh, percentages on that because uh, the organization with which I'm most familiar, International Mission Board, is pretty much the demographic uh, bank for all the other major oh, organizations. They turn to in you the world. for research. They provide us their information, and uh, we show them how to do their research. Uh -huh. So we have people all over the world, and they come to it's us. It's a partnership. It is. All of our Great Commission partners. And so you can pretty much say that right now, out of 11,700 different people groups, those are people who are joined at the, at the hip ethnically, linguistically, sometimes mm -hmm. religiously, about 11,700. You can say that about 6,000 of those, 6,000, two or 300 of those people groups are what we would call unreached. That means they are less than 2% evangelical. Okay. And of that 6,500, about 3,000 now are not only unreached, but they're unengaged. And that means that there's no boots on the ground, even with all the vast mission work that we have, no boots on the ground, people with a strategy to evangelize, disciple, and to plant multiplying churches among them. So we have work to do. I'm hearing you say, I think, that there are 3,000 ethnic people groups. There's not a church there. There's not a, maybe a copy of God's Word, but there, there's nobody working to lead them to Christ. Yeah, and, 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 you and know, how many people would that, would that, that be? That would be over half, uh, that would be over half billion people. With no witness at all. Scattered across no the world. Now, now, these folks are, you know, they're, they're unengaged and unreached for a reason. You're not going to drive by them yes. on your way to the 7-Eleven this coming, right. uh, you know, Sunday. The truth is that uh, they're on high mountains. They're in deep valleys. They're in places where they're very closed and oppressive government. Yes. They're difficult to get to, but not impossible. And the, the exciting thing, and you, you've mentioned this, uh, the exciting thing is that we know that when our Lord comes, there will be around the throne a multitude from every language, mm -hmm. people, tribe, and nation. And they'll be worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. So that means at some point prior to the Lord's coming, the gospel is going to find its way into every nook and cranny Amen. of this world's population. Amen. That's exciting. It is. And you know, to me, one of the big uh, uh, political footballs we have today is the topic of racism. And, you know, that scripture touches on it when it talks about tribe, language, um, ethnic group, which is ethne is the Greek, I believe. There's no mention of race. It's, there's one race, the human race. That's right. And they're either lost or saved. That's right. And once we're saved, all the barriers are down. We are one, and we're praising the Lord in harmony. And Well, that's the Lord's desire for us. Of course it is. And that's the picture around the throne. Yes. And uh, in between now and when that picture takes place, well, then you and I have personal responsibility to, to share the gospel with people. I, I uh, heard earlier today about uh, a man with whom I was acquainted who passed away in his sleep. In fact, I think his funeral was, was uh, today. Okay. And uh, a local, local businessman. And the moment I heard his name, I thought, I know exactly where he is. Because I remember <laughs> sitting at a table with him some years ago. And uh, he, he, after visiting with him a little bit, he said, well, I just showed up at this prayer meeting because I don't have what you guys have. And I shared the gospel with him. He opened his heart. He received Jesus Christ Amen. as his Savior. And when I heard he'd passed away, I called a staff member at the church, and I said, you know, in the early 90s, he said, yep, November of 1993. That's exactly when he openly confessed his faith in the Lord through baptism. Well, it just made me so happy. Amen. But that's what we're all supposed to be doing Amen, all the time. Amen, Tom. Amen. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, I'd like to maybe see what you could tell us about, you know, we've got our work here in America, but as we look across the globe, there are many places we cannot go. You said uh, governments that don't allow... You know, a lot of the Islamic states don't allow any churches or mission work. But what is God doing in some of those places? Well, it's very interesting that you'd ask that question. Uh, first of all, we've got to realize how few of this world's population do live in the geographical boundaries of the United States. 333 million. Right. 
now out of seven billion. The other six point seven billion live outside the boundaries of the United States. So we're about five percent yeah. right here. And and this population is expanding. I mean, soon India will be the largest nation on this earth. It'll, it'll be the first nation that will have two billion people. India is one third the size geographically of the United States. Two billion people and will so be crowded, in India. so dense. Yeah, yeah. I was just there recently and and yet at the same time the church is growing so rapidly there now you ask about how do, how do we get the gospel in those areas most of those governments might be uh, they you know you can't be in that country on a missionary visa for instance they're anti-christian but i don't know of many of those countries that are anti-business now think yes. with me think with me just for a moment how did the gospel travel so rapidly in the early days of the Christian faith, it wasn't, it wasn't actually through vocational, uh, paid uh, mission forces out there. Actually, it was businessmen, businesswomen, mm -hmm. traveling Roman roads, speaking the Greek language. I mean, it was in the fullness of time when Jesus came, and everything was poised, including all the apparatus for the spread of the gospel. Yes. And so when some of the apostles would show up in some of these places, uh, well, the truth was the gospel was already share, being shared there by businessmen and women. And so we're seeing that the great spread of the gospel in the future will be men and women whose hearts are ablaze with the gospel, who are global citizens, whose businesses take them around the world, but who are determined that no matter where they live, they are going to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So their main job is not really their secular vocation. It's their calling from God to be a follower of Jesus and share the gospel. Yeah, their life is sharing the gospel. They make a living yes. at their business. You know, so when, I, when I pastored early on uh, in my ministry, I had a most wonderful, bubbling guy. And this guy was a plumber. And when he really got that concept, he came to me one day and said, you know, Brother Kevin, I realized last week I'm an ordained Southern Baptist plumber. Well, I can understand that. And he went <laughs> out and shared the Lord on his jobs. And, you know, he well, said, I do the work to pay the bills, but I'm sharing Christ. That's there's who I a am. sense of urgency for every one of us. Yes, amen. Every, every person, we, we've been talking in these, these, these huge numbers. It's made up, these are numbers are made up of individuals, each of which has an eternal destiny. That's right. They will be alive a million, billion years from now, either in heaven or in, or hell. in hell. The difference will be having repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, I think that people ought to have a legitimate reason to believe. Amen. That if they can just hang on, somebody's going to get there with the truth of the gospel. And, and many times that's you and me. And I'm convinced, even as we hang this in the uh, you know, framework of prophetic teaching, Peter told us in his second epistle, uh, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise about returning. He said he's not willing that any should perish, right. but that all should come to repentance. Right. I think one of the themes that will be floated out, as I understand it, at the Prophecy Conference will be this sense of urgency, not just to know about the fulfillment of prophecy, but to share the gospel. Well, Tom, I, I heard you speak recently at a pastor's gathering, and we were having different seasons of prayer. And when you came and shared, it was to pray for the harvest of the globe. And you shared some things that are happening in some specific parts of the world right now that were very exciting to me. Could you could you revisit some of those scenes in Islamic areas or northern Africa places yeah, or whatever? People would be amazed, I think, to discover that uh, the Christian faith is exploding in some areas that they would consider absolutely closed. And some of those have to do with, with Africa, North Africa, in the Mideast, in Southeast Asia, in, Southeast, in South Asia. Uh, the impression that we get, of course, is, well, they're so closed, Nobody is trusting Christ, but really, many times you'll find that thousands upon thousands of people are coming to know Christ just every few months. Mm -hmm. uh, I I sat with a um, a group of of people in a very small room. I, I remember thinking to myself, as I looked around, these are beautiful feet because their feet were calloused and, oh. and bruised, and one lady's face had been beat to a pulp oh. because uh, uh, she had trusted Christ. There were nine of them. And, and, and the, the teacher kept asking, are you sharing this with others? Are you, are you sharing this with others? And uh, each of them began to say, yes, we're sharing this with our friends. Well, I'm, I, I tell you, I began to hear back from our personnel there. How do you baptize 1,200 people on one day? 
uh, then I begin to hear about thousands of people. I, I heard uh, one man said to me, he said, in our little room, they took us out. They said they got tired of us asking, are you doing this? They put us in a cab, took us out to a valley. He said, you keep asking us if we're sharing our faith with other people. He turned to the valley and whistled, and people came streaming My out of the trees. Goodness. Hundreds of first, second, and third generation believers. Not without cost, by the way. Yes. Only, ju- only a few weeks ago, one of the men who was seated beside me in that room came home to discover that his own father had killed his daughter. Oh, because the father had seen him reading the Bible to his daughter. And can you imagine a grandfather taking the, the li- life of a granddaughter? But yet, the Lord is faithful, and God is blessing the harvest in corners of this world that you would never imagine. Uh, you're probably familiar with China and the church there, and it may be that a lot of our uh, viewers are not. Can you give us some uh, pertinent information about China? Well, of course, for several years, the gospel has been exploding in China. Uh, many organizations are redeploying their personnel over in the eastern part of China over into the western part of China because the eastern part of China, uh, the gospel is just is, is moving so incredibly fast that it would make it would take your breath away. Uh Chinese believers have this determination to go back to Jerusalem I've heard and to, that. Carry, to carry the gospel all the way back to Jerusalem. That is one of the most exciting things I've heard in oh my yeah. life. Korean, uh, South Korean missionaries are flooding corners of this world with the gospel. And the reality is that we've always thought, well, the torch of the gospel has been handed to the United States because of our freedoms and our ability resources to travel and, and our things. resources. Yeah. But the reality is that the torch of the gospel has been placed in the hands of many people groups around Amen. the world. I could take you to a place not far from here. We'd have to go south to get there. But it, many people have said that's just been under a blanket of isolation, a blanket of secrecy. My wife and I uh, recently visited in that area, and we were blown away to discover that in the last 12 years, 7,000 churches had been planted. You say, well, tell us where that is. No. You've got to be I can't careful. Tell that. But 7,000 churches. That's amazing. It's amazing. Yes. Well, uh, do, you find, do you find that the church, uh, like in Afghanistan and places I've heard about, because of the persecution, um, what does that do to the stake of Christianity for the follower? Kevin, we have, we have created, I'm afraid, in our American culture, a, uh, a kind of Christianity that, that is foreign to God. I agree. And it's the idea of a suffering less church. We think we've suffered when, when somebody uh, uh, curses us out, or uh, when we can't find a parking place that, at Walmart. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We have, <laughs> we have, we have suffered. That's right. But, but, the reality is that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, and it is through suffering that God has purified the faith and brought a determination to people in corners of this world where, as you would read about it, you'd say, I don't know how they even endure, but God has is hammering into their hearts the truths of the Scripture. You've got to realize the New Testament is written, much of it in an arena of suffering, some of it from jail. Yes. And so it was not without Completely. without suffering. Um, and I think we, it's, it's time that we woke up to the reality. My My wife said recently, she said, you know, for many, many years I was afraid that things would go wrong in our nation uh, so much so that Christians would be persecuted. And I didn't want my children and grandchildren to be persecuted. She said, now, after traveling the world and yes. seeing what God is doing among the persecuted church, she said, I'm almost afraid they won't experience persecution because of what I see it doing in their hearts. That's a powerful statement. Yes, it is. Yes, now, it I is. wouldn't begin to equate what we experience here with what some of our brothers and sisters go through that face death. But I do think the temperature is coming up here in America. Oh, and, and as you know, it can it, everything can turn over in a heartbeat. Yes, but I, I think in the next, if the Lord tarries in the next decade, that we'll see more criminalization of sharing your faith Absolutely. at work and in the schools. Absolutely. And trying to scrub it out. And this is not a time to play church. The people of God need to step up and be really serious. And, and to pray seriously for genuine spiritual awakening in our nation. Um, and an awakening is something that, that, that goes way beyond governments and churches. It, it invades the very fabric of a society. And we must pray for a great spiritual awakening. We've just come through the first hundred years in the history of this nation without an awakening. 
and it's imperative, I think, that we give ourselves a prayer for spiritual awakening and for revival. That's pretty scary. Um, and I don't know what you're alluding to 100 years ago. I'm familiar with, you know, the first and second great awakening and mm-hmm. the prayer awakening of 1859 here in the United States. Maybe something, Wales had an awakening in 1905. Right, the the last century. Mm-hmm. But, but we are looking at a century without any right. anything. And um, boy, I, on one hand, it's it's very hard. On the other hand, God does great works with hard challenges. That's right. And and one of the challenges that I share, you know, from time to time with people is in regard to awakening is that, that we ought to see the necessity of awakening not just for what it can do for us, but for what an awakened nation could do in the world in terms of the gospel. Yes. So it's not just all about us. It's not, well, let's have awakening so... So we so don't have these problems. So we don't have any problems. So we don't have any criticism. No. So we don't have a lack of resources. So let's have an awakening so I'll have more people in church. Nope. No, that's not the purpose for an awakening. The purpose for an awakening is so that God can utilize us to reach the world. Well, it always goes from the people of the Lord to the people of the land. Right. That's the pattern of biblical revival, and that's certainly our desire. You know, we just came through um, an election in our nation that I think had a lot of major, uh, hopefully, you know, good consequences. But, again, we don't put our hope in men. Government is not our pro- our solution. And God is looking to the church to be the answer. It is a wonderful thing when in government, in the structure of government, you find men and women of Christ-like character, mm-hmm. genuine principles. And, and you and I are personally acquainted with some who, even in this most recent election, are now, are now in offices, in significant offices, yes. that will impact our nation. And we rejoice because we know them personally. We know their character. But they would also say to us, Kevin, government is not the answer. No, it is within not. the heart of man. And we must have God moving and awakening our nation. And what you call an awakening or a revival, to me that is when God himself takes the field. And that's what we need. We, right. we need God yeah. to shake us. And I think we're going to have to have a shaking before uh, we have a waking. Um, that's just kind of my thought. Mm-hmm. I think many would agree. Well, as we kind of begin to wind down, what, what can our uh, average viewer do with the thought about the return of the Lord and being urgent about this, are we to go on a mountaintop and sell our possessions and get white robes and look up into the sky and wait? Or what shall we do? When uh, Jean and I were living in Africa, we had a young man working for us by the name of Petros, Peter. And um, uh, Petros was an interesting guy. I found him in a ditch, literally, uh-huh. and uh, shared the gospel with him. And after he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, he came to work with me. And, of course, uh, he still need a little, he's still a little rough on the edges, you know, but just a, such a delightful person. And uh, one week, my family and I were going away to uh, South Africa, and uh, I took Petrus around our, the area where we live, and I said, I, I'd like you to take care of this, I'd like to take care of this. And when I get back, make sure this has been taken care of, this has been mowed, and this is, you know, he was to look after the place. You're right. And um, so we... Uh, now, things changed when we were down in South Africa, and we came home a couple of days early. And uh, when I <laughs> opened the gate and drove in, I, I looked around, and uh, Petrus was nowhere to be found. And, and uh, I looked at the different tasks, which I had asked him to take charge of, and he hadn't done them. And uh, I, I called for him, and he didn't appear. And I thought, this is real. Maybe he's, maybe he's quit. Maybe he's gotten hurt. Maybe, you know, what's happened here? And... Um, so uh, that night passed, and the next morning I got up early, as I'm accustomed to doing, and was having coffee, and I, I heard whistling, and I looked up the road, and, and here came Petrus with I'll his say. bicycle coming down the road, pushed his back with his bicycle. He got to the gate, took his key, unlocked the gate, walked inside, and the moment he walked inside, he saw my car parked there. <laughs> surprise. Surprise, surprise. And I walked out the door, and so... It was just so humiliating. Oh, because in his mind, as he, uh, you know, he just looked at all that I had assigned, and he thought, you know what, I can get this done in about twelve hours of good hard work. So I'm going to go off. He went off, saw some of his friends, went back home to his village, saw his parents, had just sort of played around. If you want to know the truth, ran his own agenda. He ran his own agenda, thinking, I can get it done. Yes. Before the my my, my master comes up, I can get this done. It's so like a parable so Jesus humiliating. Told. 
Well, I would hate to think that I had the same attitude. Well, you know, the Lord's been gone. He's been gone quite a while. He hasn't come yet. I don't know what's assigned to me, but I can probably get it all into shape before he returns. He could return before this show is over. That's right. He has every right. He doesn't have to tell us. He doesn't. <laughs> it's going to catch even the most dedicated by surprise, Jesus said himself. So the reality is not his coming won't catch us by surprise, but when he comes, yes, it's going to be a surprise. And so the point is we need to be operating with a sense of urgency. The Lord Jesus is coming. He's, I believe he's coming soon. We need to look up, but we need to look out to this world and these harvest fields and do everything we can before he returns. Well, it's one day sooner than it was yesterday. That's right. And Jesus said, blessed is that servant who he finds so working when he does come. And as we just finish these moments together, our guest has been Tom Elliff, uh, really a missiologist and leader in world missions, a pastor for many years, a wonderful servant of God. And uh, I just want to share in these closing seconds with you that, you know, the whole, whole issue here is one of two things. If Christ is real to you, he wants you to spend your life and your days sharing him with other people because we just have this fleeting moment we call life and then we're in all eternity forever and we need to share him with as many people as we can while we are here and he gives us breath if you don't know him it is imperative that as we shared earlier in the program jesus died and shed his blood so that we could have a way back to the god who made us and loves us and the only way is to come by jesus christ there's no other name and if you don't know him i want to urge you to call on that name Ask him to come into your life and save you and change you, and he will, and you'll be so glad you did. Until then, we are expecting his return, and let's keep looking up. Thank you. is very ripe right now. Thank you. Bill Koenig, appreciate your being here. Thank you, Gary. I'm Gary Stearman, as always, reminding you, keep looking up. He's coming, you know. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported program made possible by our many friends around the world. Be sure you tune in every day for breaking news and our daily prophetic news updates at prophecyinthenews.com or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash prophecyinthenews.